Hi there, and welcome to Art for All, the Sketchbook School podcast. I'm Danny Gregory. I am uh, an artist and a writer and a guy who has a podcast with his friend John Muir Laws. Here's John Muir Laws. John, Hi there. can you introduce yourself? Hey, everybody. Hey. I'm John Muir Laws. I'm Danny's friend, and uh, I have kind of have a scientific bent to the way that I think about things and use my drawings to kind of help me um, unpack the world for the sake of understanding. Um and uh, just sort of love the process of thinking and thinking with pictures. Bent. So you use the word bent in describing yourself. I don't know. I'm okay sure with that. I'm not sure if that's, a, that's the right word. But okay. We'll go with bent. Here he is, the man with the bent. Speaking of uh, men with bents, let's talk about no, – we're not speaking of men with bents. <laughs> Scratch that. Um <laughs> Generally, what we do on this podcast, if you've never listened to us before, is we pick a topic and then we kind of try to stay on that topic for as long as as the topic lasts. Um, but occasionally we will end up deep into the woods, far off the, the, the map. But we'll see what happens today. So what is our topic today? Because you picked today's topic. What is our topic? I wanted to explore sort of uh, learning how we learn the role of teachers, what for us are kind of the, what makes a good teacher um, and how can, I guess from the perspective of the teacher, how can I be a better teacher from the perspective of the learner? How can I be really intentional about choosing the teacher, because that makes a kind of the coach that you have to kind of pull you through something mm. makes a big difference in the approach that you take. And I, yeah. how do you find those sort of people? And what do you do when you do? So can you, when you were a kid, were there any teachers that you, that made a particular impact on you, either positively or negatively? Um, yes. Yes. The, well, I'll kind of give you the, the 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 brief arc of my are you talking about my sort of education in general or do you mean in a specific art education no in any in any form because I, mean, I think i think if somebody's a good teacher of any kind we can we can learn from that so yeah um my sort of arc was that, that sort of my background is i am dyslexic um i was struggling in school uh, this was just when the diagnosis of dyslexia was being hatched, and the it really wasn't on most teachers' radar. I had some teachers who thought that you know it was clearly just laziness, and I needed to buckle down and 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 work harder. Um, but that wasn't that wasn't what was going on in my brain. I had a number of very kind and well-meaning teachers as well but they they a, a lot of folks were not kind of we're not really meeting we're, we're trying to kind of help this square peg fit through the round hole as best they could um it by the time i got to high school i had pretty much given up on myself. I, I decided that, you know, the, the easiest explanation for why I can't do the same sort of things that my classmates can do is that I am stupid. Mm -hmm. And I figured out, okay, I'm a dumb kid. And how are you going to, what are you going to do about that? Well, um, I can be, I can be a disruptor. <laughs> um, I can, uh, be the class clown. I can hide behind that mask, and I can also stop trying, because if I f do my best and I fail, um, I then go away feeling that, that's 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 horrible. Um, but if I didn't really try and I failed, well, maybe, maybe it was it, it kind of was my just a little bit of extra armor 
for myself. There were, however, two teachers that I had in high school. One was a biology teacher named Alan Ridley. The other was a history teacher named Leroy Voto. And they saw through that screen and they didn't need me to spell things right, to get things, to, to jump through that hole. They met me where I was and engaged me with my ideas in a mm -hmm. way that was really exactly what I needed at the right time. And in the, mat in the course of one year, those two men turned my world upside down and set me on the trajectory that I am today. You're lucky you found them or they found you. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, they, and, and a number of the other teachers that I, I had in the, in uh, of other teachers that I had, they, they were good people who were doing their best to help me. Um, but yeah, there's something about just the, yeah, the, the, the approach that they had allowing me to spell it wrong, but express my ideas. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that, that changed my world. Yeah, that's interesting. So, um, and did they orient you to what you have ended up focusing on with your life? Do you think? Oh, oh yeah. I decided I'm either going to be a historian or a biologist because of this. Right. And uh, it turns out that the historians have to read more. And because I am dyslexic, that reading process is surprisingly challenging. You know, I, I want to just be able to pick up a book and flow into it. But I never really kind of reach flow with books. It's always just the it's it's work to get it in there. So but, but with biology, you know, I could look at, uh, you know, it's look at the flower. There's the flower in front of you. I'd be sitting in front of the real phenomenon, not not an account of what this phenomenon was a yeah, hundred years ago. And um, so that um, so I became a biologist, and I, I think that perhaps if I had uh, been easier for me to read, I would be a historian right now. <laughs> but, but yeah, that, that's interesting. Set me do, on this do, track. Do you, um, do you, have you ever had any contact with them since, since you were in school? I have, I yeah. have, and I've done my best to let them know that they changed my world. And also, if you look in the books that I've written, there, uh, the two of them are always in the acknowledgements. That's great. That's good. That's nice that you honor them that way. Yeah. I, uh, you know, I went to lots and lots of different schools because we moved so much when I was a kid. I went to something like, I don't know, 15 or 20 different schools and, um, in different languages, in different countries, different continents. Um, so it was really kind of a a blur a lot of the time. Um, and, you know, when I, I mean, I went from being, I mean, I think the first school I ever went to was in Pittsburgh. And then, no, no, the first school I went to was in Pakistan. And then I went to Pittsburgh and then we went to Australia. In Australia, I went to two different schools. And then- You, you we, are moving all over the map. <laughs> Yeah, then I went back to Pakistan and I went to um, school there and then I went to Israel and I lived on a kibbutz and then I lived in a small town and went to a school there in Hebrew. Um, and, you know, so it was just, it was a lot of different things. And I, I was always a new kid, so I don't think any teachers paid any particular attention to me. I think the most valuable thing any teacher did up to that point was when um when i was living on this kibbutz and everybody all the kids were israelis and they all just spoke hebrew which i came to the school literally not speaking a word of it um and the teacher said to me just sit there at your desk and you can read read whatever books you want to that you brought with you and you just sit there just do whatever you want and that was actually 
sounds like strangely hands off, but it was actually the way that I learned the language really quickly because I just sat there, read my own thing, but also listened. And I didn't have any demands on me. Like I didn't have to do any of the work, but eventually I did, but I kind of came to wanting to do it, you know, just because I started to understand what they were doing. And then, um, we moved to the small town. I went to an Israeli school there and there, there was, there were kind of no concessions made for me. It was just like, you're just another student. And, um, I was, I wrote papers in Hebrew. I mean, I was 11, 12 at age and I did everything. Um, just, I was just like one of the other kids literally a year after coming to a country that I didn't speak any language and didn't know anything about it. So, so that was like immersion is something that I've continued to believe is like really uh-huh. an important part of the, of the process of learning is just like being around people doing it. And I think about it, thinking in terms of art education, um, you know, you think about, you know, what art school did Da Vinci go to? What art school did Michelangelo go to? Um, well, they went to the art school of being an employee, being basically being an apprentice, working in, you know, uh, the studio of an artist and just kind of hanging around and doing stuff. And that's kind of how I, when I became a professional, that's how I learned my job was, you know, so I think that that way of learning is, is really important learning by doing, learning by watching. And that's how, that's how we learn as small children. How do we learn to speak, speak in the first place? You know, we don't go to, there's no, our parents aren't taught how to teach us. It's all instinct, right? And we just, we watch people do stuff. We watch them do it over and over again. And then we try and do it ourselves. And at first we don't know how to do it. And then eventually we kind of figure it out. And then maybe somebody will say to us, no, no, do this, do it this way. But if you have the patience, to just kind of be around other people who know how to do what you want to do, eventually you'll know how to do it. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I think there are probably more efficient ways of doing it. And I think that that's basically what education is kind of its job, an educational program. Its job is to be a bit more efficient. But the fact is kids go to school for, you know, what, 13 years plus college to learn stuff. Um, I don't know how incredibly efficient that is necessarily. I think, I think school has a lot of other purposes besides just teaching people stuff. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. But but just sort of bouncing into that, um, that there's sort of two thoughts kind of occurred to me. One is that the, we, we know that our kids can learn. <clears throat> I think what we grownups have to remember is that we have the same plasticity. We have the same abilities to continue to learn ourselves in our adulthood mm-hmm. and that that window doesn't close. You can still learn new skills. So the old dog can learn lots of new tricks and that the more that we can kind of create an environment for ourselves that's conducive to that, the faster it'll happen. But we are absolutely capable of continuously learning through. We used to think that like the human brain developed, um, at, you know, adding neurons and then somewhere in adolescence, it would stop growing. And you're just, that's kind of the package that you had for the rest of your life. And, um, and Bob's your uncle. And, but Now we know that the human brain continuously is all learning, is laying down new neural tracks in your head, building new material in your brain anytime you are learning anything. And that is that realization is so important and so powerful because it gives you permission then to dive in and do the work to develop these new skills. Yeah, I, yeah. I also wonder if, as you get older, if you allow yourself to, you actually probably have the ability to learn better, right? You're, dis- you're less distracted. You're more motivated. You also have a history of learning, like you know that you you know that you're able to learn because you've learned many things in your life. So I would think that as you get older, you actually can be a better student, not a worse think- one. Sort of the reverse of what people tend to think. Yeah, that the that part of what you're learning is you're learning how to learn. How do I learn? And also, the more um, ideas you have in your head, 
the the more that you can then come handle complexities and nuances that are um are 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 beyond what you can do when you just start um you know even listening let's say listening to a piece of music somebody um i had a friend who took a, a class where the purpose of the class was to study one piece of music one a uh, uh, forget whether it was classical or jazz, but the entire class was about this. And this, this piece of music, and by the end of that class, there were just all these levels of, when they listened to it, they said they can identify now all these levels of, of, of nuance and structure there that they could then apply to listening to other pieces of music. And it made the process of listening to music even more enjoyable but what they had done is they had given themselves a scaffolding for thinking about things and when they were just listening to it before their brain was just overwhelmed by all this noise coming in but then they could understand that on a completely different level that's really interesting yeah i mean i think learning to learn i mean in a lot of ways that's probably what school school's most valuable thing is. Because I think so much of the knowledge and information we learn in school eventually ebbs away, right? I mean, I if you ask me to do trigonometry or, I mean, I, I don't even quite know what the difference is between calculus and algebra and trigonometry anymore. I'm not even sure conceptually what those differences are, let alone all the information I spent so much time trying to learn and to memorize and, and um, you know, it's like you learn a language in school, and unless you unless you ever practice that language, unless you ever go to France or something, you're never gonna, you know, make, keep that information. But it's it's sort of like building these pathways and building these experiences of how did I learn something? Mm. You know, because those are the things that are applicable. I mean, I've told this story before, but I um, I want to tell you it again because it's to me it's really impactful. So when my son got into art school, we went to the Rhode Island School of Design for a tour. And we were going around the campus and we met, we went to the graduate department. It's part of the graduate school department of furniture design. It wasn't anything that he was interested in, but it was kind of just part of the tour. We went there and there was a teacher there. And I said to him, so what's the deal like what happens if you get a graduate degree in furniture design? Like, do you go and work for Ikea? Do you make like $10,000, you know, uh, coffee tables? Like, what, how do you apply this knowledge? And he said, well, he said, there's a bunch of different ways. He said, but that's not really the way to look at it. He said, ultimately, he said, learning, uh, learning what every student who comes to RISD learns is they learn how to be a creative person. Mm. <laughs> they all come away with that same lesson. And he said, so what's important about that is it's really hard to learn all the things you need to be a creative person, but they're basic fundamental things. You need to learn how to have ideas. You need to learn um, how to collaborate with other people. You need to learn how to get feedback and handle it. You need to learn how to execute your ideas, how to find resources to help you do that. There's all these basic things that doesn't matter whether you're a filmmaker or a weaver or a furniture designer, you're going to need these fundamental um, skills. And they take a lot of work. And so you, what you have to do is you have to find something that you are passionately interested in because it's only by having that discipline that you're going to be willing to put the work in. If you don't care, you're not going to do it. You know, and you think about how many things we learned in, in high school, how many things we had to take and the classes you had to take and you just didn't care because you didn't care about the result. You didn't, you know, you weren't interested in trigonometry, let's say, um, and no teacher made you interested in it. Then you didn't learn these fundamental things that ultimately were the real reason that you were there, you know? And so he said, so ultimately what happens is you pick a track that you're interested in, 
you know, and maybe you come in thinking, I'm going to be a graphic designer, but then you fall in love with um, textile design and you, or you find a field that you didn't even know was a field. You didn't even know the furniture design existed, but suddenly you go, this is fascinating. I love this. And so therefore I'm willing to do all, pull the all nighters. I'm willing to, you know, do all the th hard work that's required to do this thing. And when I emerge, maybe I'll become a furniture designer, but maybe I'll do something completely different. And my own son who was, went there to study painting, he now works making props in the movies. But so many of those skills that he learned from painting are the skills that have allowed him to become a prop maker, you know? And uh, so that, that, so I think that that idea of like, what are the foundational skills? What are the, what's the foundational knowledge you need um, is really crucial, you know? And I, I think, you know, I mean, I think we have a, a decent education program, but I think the fact that we have to educate as many people as we do and there's, you know, it, everything's operating at scale. And so testing and all these kinds of other things have kind of distorted the process, you know, but at, at its core, I think it's that. It's that, like, what are the foundational things that you need to know? And particularly when it comes to art making, what are those foundational things? I, I like that way of framing it. So you're, 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 <clears throat> you're creating sort of the fertile ground that all the rest of, and the, and the scaffolding that uh, okay, I'm mixing metaphors like a demon here. Um, <laughs> not that demons are particularly known for mixing metaphors, but that's mixed too. That, but but there's that you're you're creating this really useful substrate for whatever you want to do in that. So I love it that the, the, the there's this program on furniture design that is not really about making furniture. It's, I mean, it is. It's kind of like it's kind of like you've built a machine, and that machine can do lots of things. It's like a Swiss Army knife, right? So you might right. use it to make machine. You might make, use it to make design, furniture, but you might also use it to do animation, or you might use it to paint murals. Mm -hmm. But you're going to need those same things. And when you come to school, when you come, particularly when you go to art school, what do you think you need? You need to be able to draw, right? That's why that's why people go to art school. When they're in high school, they can draw, and so they get they come. And, or they don't. Actually, I was surprised at how many kids went to RISD and couldn't draw anything. My son was always marveling at that. Like, why did they even come here? They came there because they were weird kids. They were the kids with, like the blue hair. And that's why they ended up in art school, I guess. They were, <laughs> they were the weirdos. The, um, and well, I think that the, the, the same also even applies to something like, like medical school. My understanding is like for the first you know, four years of medical school, the, the, the stuff that you learn at the start of, of learning how to be a doctor, you're never going to use. Mm -hmm. And this stuff, but what you're doing each year is you're kind of ratcheting up your ability to kind of put these ideas together and sort of how to think like a doctor. And you're preparing your brain for when you're finally in fellowship at the end of your training, that in those couple of years of fellowship, that's where you're going to learn 90% of the stuff that you're going to use every day on the job. But right, and you, can, you, can read, you couldn't start there because you needed to, to, to create the brain scaffolding and the, uh, all the rest of my mixed metaphors um, for, for, for being able to understand and integrate that information that you finally are going to get at the end of that training. Right, because if you're a doctor, you know you have to read the medical journals that come out every month. You know you have to. You're constantly having to continue to be educated for the rest of your career because there are developments in science that are important for you to know about. So you know if you could just learn, if you could just graduate from medical school and then boom, you're done. You could just be a doctor forever. No, you have to learn these. How do you update yourself? How do you continue to to stay current? That's a be a lifelong learner. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. essential. So, so you have to you have to be in love with learning. And I think I think we talked about this a while ago about organic chemistry and how like that organic chemistry class. I remember it from college. I didn't take it because it was like unbelievably hard. And they basically used that class to weed out all the people who thought they wanted to be doctors <laughs> but couldn't actually be bothered to do the work. Right. 
And I think that that's true in a lot of disciplines. It's like part of education's job is to just filter people so that they, you know, end up in the right area for them. Um, well, well, you know, well uh, it would be nice if it was filtering us so that people end up in the right place for themselves. Um, another way of looking at it is that the education system may be a filtering system so that people kind of run, uh, you know, kind of end up being the right kind of cog in the machine that the larger institution needs. Mm -hmm. But that may not be the right place for that person as an, an individual. So that... Right, because there are always yeah. jobs that you go, how did, somebody, how did somebody decide that that's what they were going to do for a living? Right? There's all kinds of obscure jobs and you go, how did... Did you always want to be like an air conditioning repair person? Did you always want to be, you know, whatever it is? No, but there's there are systems that kind of funnel people into that, and that's where the opportunities lie. So, anyway, and, and also the, the 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 career that we we choose to to, to make our the the money you know, doesn't have to be something that is, um, you know, it, what inspires us. Um, in in life and gives us our meaning. It's nice when it does work out that way, but you can also be uh, uh, doing a a job that uh, that that pays your bills, but then also have the bandwidth for whatever creative expression you want to take or other things that kind of give your your world and 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 life meaning um right but maybe people end up those, in, i'm sorry go ahead oh it's because anyway but but having that kind of growth mindset again is important for being able to sort of see that you can develop those those other um regions and areas of 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 you know to be like realize you can pick up the pencil and you can learn to draw you can pick up the ukulele and you can learn to play uh a, a musical instrument. You can build those. Um, you can bring those elements into your life, and still something that you can learn at any age. But in your case, your teachers, maybe not deliberately, but your teachers kind of found or help you helped you to find a place of utility, right? Because you could have ended up you know, doing something that used your abilities much less so, right? Because you had this limitation. There's certain things you weren't good at or certain things you weren't predisposed to. But but part of the process of you're going to school was to eventually find areas that you were really interested in and that you could apply your, your strengths to, right? So that you ended up being, uh, do you think that, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I think you're right. I, I, I was lucky to be able to to fall into studies that I was excited about and was interested in, I really liked nature, mm -hmm. and I was very interested in that. And so that kind of went along with the, the you know being a biologist, being a being a scientist, and being able to to, to look at those um, those those sorts of of phenomena, right. Yeah, but you found people who helped to guide you. Yeah. So let me ask you, let's talk about, about ourselves as teachers um, because that's part of what we both do for a living now. And did you, have you been a teacher for a long time? And do you feel like- Yeah. You, yeah, so you- uh, my, I, I kind of came- uh, here, here's my, my, my path on, on, on teaching is that I, I started off, <clears throat> excuse me, I started with an interest in, in nature science and natural history and was doing, was, was, was teaching things sort of to, to pay my bills, thinking that at some point I would kind of graduate to becoming a Farley Moat character running off into the wilderness somewhere tracking grizzly bears with a Yagi yeah. antenna and, <laughs> and, and like, I'm going to be doing all this original research. That's what, who I, that's where I thought my trajectory was, but it wasn't. So my, my, cause you know, here's what happened. I started off, I, uh, as my, my first job was teaching. So I was teaching, um, nature at a boy scout camp teaching nature merit badges and then i became a director of the 
uh, the nature department at the Boy Scout camp, still teaching nature. And then during college, I became an interpretive student aide working at a, at a local nature preserve teaching nature. But, and so not just sort of, you know, doing uh, research, but, but teaching. And then in the summers, I would work at the Teton Science School. I would work at different um, environmental education organizations. I then worked as a teacher at a residential outdoor science school where groups of fifth and sixth graders would come up for a week and I would teach nature to them. <laughs> and, um, and then I thought, like, and now it's time for me to go be a scientist. So I went off to graduate school to become a wildlife biologist. And during that time, I was doing my research, but I realized that one of the things that I really am loving is that I get to be a teaching assistant while I'm, you know, to pay my bills here at, at, at school. And I just, you know, I love geeking out doing that. And, you know, just realize that my my, I just love the idea of kind of taking ideas and concepts, trying to help figure out like, how are these relevant? How can I explain that in a way or, or present this in a way that somebody can, that it can open up a door to somebody that it, that it, that it makes sense that. So I just found myself teaching, 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 teaching. That was the substrate that really motivated me. If I teach a class and I feel like that came out really, really well. I like that. I, there, there's a big slosh of dopamine that my brain gets. I find that the process of trying to, trying to teach challenging because I have to force my brain to wrap around something enough that I can then um, make it accessible to somebody else. So it, yeah, teaching it's, it's my jam. It's my identity. Um, and uh, what about for your for for yourself? How did you yeah, come well, to be? Well, yeah, I mean, well, in, I, one, one question before I say that, I wanted to say, how did you learn to be a teacher? Did you study to be a teacher? Um, I I would take uh, there 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 were it, it comes from two things. One, lots of different directions. So part of it is that you can there are books on you know here's how to be a nature guide there are books on uh for a park interpreter here's how you how you do these things there are um classes that you can take to uh do a project wild workshop where they're going to teach you all these activities and games and things that you can play that get it sort of address different environmental concepts um, there's also looking at the examples of people who are good teachers and watching them at work and seeing what they do. And, but the, the most interesting kind of change in my teaching came about through just my own direct observation. It's not something that I, I learned in any book, but from my interactions with students. I was, I was working at the Walker Creek Outdoor School. So every week I'd get a different batch of fifth and sixth graders. I could bring them out into the field uh, uh, all day with little bag lunches. And I had this block of time to connect them with nature. And I was doing what I thought I was a, a good nature guide should be doing. I was doing these environmental education games. I was... Um, you know, some plant identification and these sorts of things. And I had the subjective experience that, all right, I'm being, that I'm a good teacher, right? My, the, the students liked me. I had good classroom control. They gave me good evaluations. So what could possibly going, go wrong? Well, I realized that something was going wrong because I, my, my prep area for the next day was across a very flimsy divider from a place where the teachers at the end of the day would meet with their students and talk with the kids about what did you do during the day? And th they would say, well, we went to here, we did this, we did this, we did this. You know, how do you like your naturalist? Uh, we think we think Mr. Jack is great. And, uh, and what did you do? Well, we went, we played these games, you know, and, and they would essentially describe playing tag. 
right? Which is kind of the, the the background of this game. Like I had been thinking to myself, like, no, but you're 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 the jackrabbit and you're the fox, and I'm teaching about food web. So I, I'm I've got all these kind of glorious plans of like what I'm teaching, and the kids were playing tag, and I was you you were a gym started, teacher. I was yeah, and they, they, they were, it was it was great, and they were outdoors, and that was fun, and you know we climb to the top of the peak and all those good things. But a lot of the stuff that I thought I was teaching was not what was being learned. And as during this time in my own free time, I would be grabbing my sketchbook and I would uh, go out and draw flowers and the foxes or some very cooperative fox in this area and the deer and make little landscape drawings. And when I'd be out with my students during our lunch breaks, I'd pull out my journal and just start sketching and journaling. And the kids would start watching this and they say like, oh, can we do that too? And the kids turned out that during their lunch breaks, they wanted to be doing nature journaling with me. And so I started making little nature journals and bringing them and we'd pass them out during lunch. And then I thought, well, why? And then they would come back and they would say, you know, like, oh, and then during lunch, we got to do this nature journaling thing. And like, look, we're looking at this and look at this flower that I was observing and the shape in the mountains. The kids were doing incredible nature observation during those times. And I realized like that's much more valuable than this other stuff that I thought I was supposed to be doing. So I just started gradually, the, the, the more that I, I turned my curriculum over to, let's go outside with a group of kids, you know, climb a mountain and do some nature journaling together. It really got kids observing and connecting with that place in a way that was profoundly different. And that changed the way that I taught. And it got me started teaching nature journaling from those observations of those kids. It makes it makes a lot of sense. It makes sense that keeping a journal would be a great way to observe nature, and that observing nature is a great way to learn about it. I mean, it seems like a pretty linear thing. It's it's almost surprising that that isn't a standard part of the curriculum, you know. But maybe it's again people's. I mean, I I, I remember being um, I was doing uh, residencies in a bunch of international schools, and I was trying to explain to teachers, I gave a presentation to teachers talking about how keeping a sketchbook could be a way of learning basically anything that you could have. Mm -hmm. You know, you could study history in a sketchbook. You could certainly study science and nature in a sketchbook. Um, that really it could fit into so many different things and that we think of art as being the sort of niche kind of off to the side thing, but how in fact, when it's brought into the center of what you're doing, um, it becomes just a way of engaging differently. But the teachers themselves, I think, were so averse to personally drawing mm. that the huh? idea of asking, you know, because I was showing like, I was showing how um, to tell a story using drawing. And I was saying like, let's try and make uh, a six frame comic strip about a story from your family. So instead of writing a short story, let's do that and let's break it down into things. And kids were completely comfortable with that. They were comfortable with the idea of drawing. They were comfortable with the idea of comic books. Um, you know, and certainly there are pl places where graphic novels and comic books are part of the curriculum, but not making them. But I think that doing something like that, breaking a story down into sort of six frames is a way of getting to its essence. And if you can get to its essence, that's a great way to, to learn to be a writer is to work down the essentials and the structure of a story through that kind of a thing. But I found that the limitation was the teacher's aversion to drawing in, in this particular case. But um, oh, I, I yeah. think that, that that's very, very true. Because yeah. um, the, the teacher, like if, if I'm supposed to teach, uh, let's say I haven't looked at trigonometry in years, and all of a sudden, I'm supposed to teach trigonometry. I'd better be good at trigonometry in order to be able to, to do that. So people, th the teachers think that in order to teach art, they need to be a practiced artist themselves. That's not in their comfort zone. That's a threat. And if they have a bit of a fixed mindset, and I think people often have a fixed mindset about their artistic capabilities, um, that's, that's, that's dangerous. That's, 
oh, I have no way would I want to do that. No, exactly. Yeah. I mean, it would be weird to have kids be better, <laughs> better at what you're teaching mm-hmm. than you are. But, but I, I, I don't know. I mean, to me, I remember the first time I had to start teaching was um, I was asked to teach a class on drawing. And it was at this sort of, it was, um, what was it called? I can't remember. It was, it was a place in New York. And they asked me, they said, would you be in uh, the open center? They said, would you be interested in teaching a class here? And I was like, I guess. Uh, I don't know why I even said that. But but they said, um, yeah, it'll be like a five or six week class. And um, you'll f- have like three hours. <sighs> I honestly, I had no idea what to do. I'd never taken an art class. I really hadn't since maybe oh. in high school I'd taken it, but mm-hmm. I'd never taken a class. I'd never learned how to be a teacher. I had no, I had never gone to a workshop. I had no idea what it was. Um, and I was extremely anxious that I would, that my inability to, or lack of knowledge about this would be really obvious. So massive, um, you know, imposter syndrome. Yeah. So I s- super over prepared, and I had you know like f- hours of slides and you know incredibly you know complicated assignments and all this stuff, and um, you know so these people came and eventually I kind of saw that it was really tedious. Like I'm standing there presenting a PowerPoint presentation for half the class. Um, and it just, it got, eventually I kind of lightened up, but I remember then the next thing I had to do is I had to, I led a three day workshop in Massachusetts. And again, I was incredibly ill-prepared, not, I was incredibly over-prepared and therefore Mm ill-prepared. So I just thought like, okay, I need to give them a a huge amount of information. I need to make this seem to be a really valuable. To justify this. Justify it. Like, yeah. Like, who am I? Like, you know, yep. like, how do I assert my, uh, my situation, my, you know, my right to do this? And um, people just want to come and draw. They just, want an ex- they just want an excuse to draw. You know, I'm going and taking a workshop and we're just going to sit around and draw. And um, it took me really a long time to get over that. And I just, I just try to try to avoid being called a teacher because I felt so insecure about it. And then when I was doing this um, programs in schools, you know, I was doing, I was treating these things like as if I was doing like a keynote presentation at a conference and, uh, you know, just sit there and just, please just don't ask me anything until I get through this. And, um, or I was treating it like a business presentation and took me a while to finally start to think about how I learn stuff. And how, what is the process that I'm going through? What are the things that mattered to me when I was learning something? What were the, and also how you don't really need to learn that many things in a given education situation for it to be really valuable. If you take away like two ideas, that might be all you need for to make yeah. a radical transformation in your, in your um, practice or whatever it is. And that kind of made it easier because I started thinking like, what were the things that are really important? Um, what are the real points? And it's not, and I also started to think about teachers who mattered, have mattered to me, tend to be teachers who I had some kind of a personal connection to. That it wasn't just their, the material and their grasp of the material, but like, how did it, were they the kind of people I wanted to be like in some way? And did they seem to have, and a really authentic connection to this stuff so that it really seemed to matter to them? You know, were they really interested in history? History history is a subject that as an adult, I'm fascinated by. I read a lot of books about history, but in high school, I couldn't have cared less as we bolted through like 250 years of American history in, you know, eight years. <laughs> and it was like, oh my God, this, like there was no, but when you start to tell stories and you start to make things relevant, then, then my imagination is seized by it. And I, and I start to get excited too. And I want to learn more and I want to find out on my own and I want to make it my own. Yeah. Yeah. That, that last point I think is, that's, that's a, a really powerful take home in this, that the idea that if you can, 
um, uh, just sort of going back to my my hero, my, my history teacher, Leori Voto. I, re- I remember being in a class with him on the on the French Revolution, right? And you could see this something where, where uh, in a, uh, you could have a a kid in high school sitting there saying like, you know, uh, why should I care about this? But one thing that he got a we kind of came across in the course of this class is we got a sense of why Leroy thought this was so he why he felt that this was so worthwhile of of his time of our time and we kind of we got that sense of of excitement why is it that this is something that you'd be so passionate about that you would devote your life to to studying to researching to 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 sharing with other people if and but think about that in terms of a statistics class um when i was at uh university of montana we had uh the graduate students the other graduate students and i we were to take this statistics class and the teacher who was uh, giving us that statistics class um, in so many words explained to us that we were we were lazy we didn't understand we didn't appreciate statistics and that um, we were going to fail and <laughs> we were and nobody was learning anything and it was such an infuriating thing because st- statistics is is actually this incredibly fascinating area of how can you how can you get your brain to think in a way that is outside of our brain's sort of usual box of kind of learning from anecdote and story how can we look at the power of numbers to to help us see patterns that are there and weed out the patterns that are not that's super useful i'd say probably one of the uh, more important for it than people um, to learn trigonometry would be for people to get an understanding of statistics. Um, sort of, you know, a side note, I think that like the lottery, it's, it's a tax on people who haven't taken statistics. Um, the, uh, well, it's but, like that, there's that book, there's a book that was in a podcast called Freakonomics that explained basically economics as storytelling in a way and how fascinating economics can be. Economics is again, something that I remember taking in college. And I mean, now I wish I could go back and take economics again, you know, cause it seems so relevant to just every aspect of life and certain teachers by who understand that and can communicate that passion can make it really exciting. I remember in, in college, yes. I, I had a, I had a teacher his name was D.W. Robertson Jr., and he was the world's leading expert on Chaucer. And again, Chaucer is something I'd never really read, but we read the Canterbury Tales. We spent the whole semester just reading the Canterbury Tales. And he made the Canterbury Tales, which we were reading in Middle English, he made it so fascinating and so exciting. It was like watching the best movie. And every yes. year he would read yes. it. There was one particular tale, I think it was the Miller's Tale. He would read it and People who had graduated 20 years before <laughs> would come back to school just to, to listen to him to give this lecture again because it was so electric, so fascinating. Oh. And you think like people who who are, who really get what they're teaching right. and really understand it can make it come alive no matter how tedious it would seem to be. But but just to to yeah, so that that experience of people kind of coming back for that lecture on Chaucer read in Middle English, that at, where you're where you're going to electrify the room. That actually can be done with statistics. Sure. What what the graduate students and I did is we quit our class mid sem- uh, uh, semester. We all decided we're not going to do this anymore. We found there's a um, there was this uh, uh, little. Um, uh, this this one professor in the forestry department, who was he was this he, he was a, a an, an immigrant from from Germany. He had 
um, all sorts of wonderful, you know, quirky mannerisms. He had learned all the idioms of the day. Um, he had been told that the, the the hardest thing to learn about English is the idiom. So he decided he's going to invest in that, and he did that somewhere just after the um, sort of post-war, and never updated any of his idioms. And um, but he was passionate about statistics and the thinking behind it and why it's useful. And uh, we asked this person, would you, uh, we have quit our class on statistics. <laughs> would you please, um, would you take up uh, the, the mantle of this for us? We want you to teach us statistics. And um, we, we want to do it in a way that's going to be useful and practical. And it absolutely came alive for all of us. And we also got a sense of why this, 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 there's this, there's this really little guy, why this, why this little man with the heavy accent, why he was so excited about it. And that um, joy of playing with numbers and thinking in this way, he transferred to all the students in that class. Yeah, that's a real gift. I mean, I think, look, you're a good teacher in part because you love what you're doing. You do it, you practice it yourself. And so you're able to give people experiences that help them to capture your enthusiasm for it. I think for me, when I started to teach people how to do illustrated journaling, there were times where I would deviate from my passion. Because to me, the thing that I really wanted to, that I love the most is just kind of drawing stuff in my life. You know, it's not, it's not particularly deep um, in terms of, and I always wondered, like, how do I actually teach people that? You know, it's just a sort of specific thing to me. Um, and I started to realize that and I, I started to think that I should teach them other stuff. I should teach, teach them how to draw people. I should teach them how to do, you know, draw cars and how to draw buildings. And I kind of drifted away, I think, from why I was doing that. Because I'd never learned how to draw people or learn how to draw cars particularly. I just draw a car because I thought it was a cool car or I was drawing a street scene of a place that meant something to me. And therefore I had to learn how to draw a building and how to draw the car outside of it, how to draw the people. I had, the reason was I wanted to tell the stories of these mm -hmm. things. And it was easy for me to lose track of that because I thought, well, that's not really what people teach. Like they teach these basic skills of drawing and painting and I should teach people how to use watercolors, but I, like I'd never learned from anybody. I just kind of figured it out by doing it. But I felt like, well, if I'm a teacher, I should do these things. And yeah. increasingly, and this is true of so many things that matter to me, is I've realized that like specificity is really important. Like the specifics of the niche that you're in, if you can focus on the niche that you're interested in and just delve deep into that, you don't have to be a generalist. And if anything, being a generalist, there's a lot of competition. There's a lot of other people who can be generalists. But if you're interested in a very particular thing and you can get really deep into it, some people will want to know that stuff. And they and those are the people who you will teach the most easily and will get the most out of what you're teaching. So it's not like being part of the going to teacher's college and coming out and going like, I guess I'll be an English teacher. Um, if you can do something that's that's and I think no matter what it is you're teaching, if you can find, again, what is that personal connection to yourself? What is that thing that really matters to you? It's really rich and endless. Um, but I think if it doesn't come from that point. So in a, in a way, I'm, I'm, I'm saying two things because earlier I was giving that example of learning the fundamentals. I think you need to learn the fundamentals, but then you need to learn the, to engage in the authentic passionate thing you have and plug that into those fundamentals. Those two things. Have I like to, that way of thinking like, about it. It's kind yeah. of like I have a car, but now I need to drive somewhere I care about. 
So, you know, so it's like the, the operating of the car is like the basic things I need to know, but now I'm going off on an adventure and I'm going to use this ability. I have this structure, this framework, but I'm going to fill it with what really matters to me. And if I do that, I'll continue to refine the structure. I'll continue to get better and better at using it. And I'll also, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. you know, and I'll get deeper and deeper into the thing that I'm passionate about learning. That's yeah, I, I find that when I'm trying to learn something new, if I can see myself using that or even see myself teaching that, my brain absorbs it much more easily. Um, but if I don't see how that's relevant to me, then my brain doesn't want to pick that up and 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 play with it. Um, and don't you think so that's I, true of learning as well? That like when it comes to learning, if you want to learn whatever it is you want to learn, yeah. like figure out why you want to learn it. You know, like, what is it about? Like, like I've had that experience of like, I'd love to learn to play the piano or I'd love to learn to play the guitar. But then I realized like, I don't know that there's anything I particularly want to be able to play on the piano or the guitar to warrant going through all the work I'm going to have to do to learn them, these things. I just sort of like the idea of that, but it's not a, it's not a deep enough passion and intensity for me to actually go through the pain of having to practice scales and do all the other crap that you have to do to learn something. So you've got to, in the end, have a real good reason for wanting to learn this particular thing. And as, and as adults, that's what we can do. You know, I mean, you might just have the passion to learn, right? You might just say, I just love learning stuff, you know, learning new and different things. I don't know how deep you'll ever get with any particular area of knowledge, if that's your thing, but you'll have fun learning. But also, I think if you do have a skill, like really try and figure out why is this that you want to learn this particular thing? And it's not because you wanted to do it when you were 15 in that particular way, but you might've wanted to do it since you were 15. And now's the time that you actually have the time and resources to do it. In which case, like try and get back to what was that real reason? Um, and how can you be passionate about it? I don't know. Yeah. yeah that sort of ties yeah. into sort of the, just all the thinking around intrinsic motivation. So how do you get yourself to be motivated from the inside, not because you're going to get, not for the grade, not for the cookie that you're going to be given, not because of the salary. How can you get yourself to be driven by, by, by what you do? Um, people, one way framework that people have come up with for, um, for, for thinking about that is sort of three factors, yeah. mastery, purpose, and autonomy. That, and here you're really talking about purpose. Pay attention to your purpose of why you are wanting to do this. What, why this thing just sort of is, is, is meaningful and motivating to you. Mm -hmm. And the more things, that, the more that it ties into, like for instance, like some people are really, really into their pets. Right. So I would say taking classes on uh, drawing sports cars, not going to be your thing, but, but to, to then, you know, to, to draw your cat 500 times because you are crazy about your cat, you can get into that and you're going to get better and better and better. And, and because it's connecting with something that you really love, you're going to be able to do that more. And the other thing that's really cool about that is that the other another piece of the of the pie of intrinsic motivation is this idea of of mastery knowing that having a growth mindset knowing that through my work and my effort that I'm going to get better and you can sit there and feel like this feels difficult to me this feels really really challenging to me and uh know that that's not the reason that you should give up but but know that that is that's the feeling of your brain growing and that through that work you're you're getting better and then to have the autonomy to be able to say like i really am into my cat and you know what i'm okay with that um and to um so those autonomy mastery and purpose those ideas those tie into how we learn. And if we have, as educators, can help people find and follow what is what they are passionate about, and also as educators help people 
really come back to again and again the messages and lessons of the growth mindset, the degree to which this actually is something that I can do and it's getting better and it will continue to get better the more that I, I strive and work in this area. Good. Well, that feels like a conclusion. I feel like I, I feel like I haven't held up my end on this conversation today because I feel like a little bit out of my depth. I haven't thought that much about, about it. I thought a bit about it. It's ironic because I, my business is that I run a school, but <laughs> You think I've thought about teaching a bit more, but failing that anyway. Yes, well, I've, 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 I've really enjoyed um, hearing your 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 thoughts and 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 ideas about. It. There's there's one other point that I actually wanted to kind of bat around with you. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. If we, if we could, and that is sort of the the dueling forces of um, inspiring people and demystifying the process. Like something that I think about in terms of art teachers, something that, you know, when I look at their work, if I go like, oh my gosh, that's incredible. And I have no way of unpacking that, right? Um, that deflates me. Um, so how, what are your thoughts about the degree? You know, sometimes what I, I find, sometimes people will look at, or I'll look at people's drawings and that kind of fixed mindset voice will kind of come up like, Oh, that's just so good. Right. And I'm not, and it can be the, the, the ease with which some of the apparent ease with which somebody kind of does something. Um, and the, the quality of it, I can start judging myself and that demotivates me. Or I can be looking at that same sort of thing and be motivated like, like, oh, wow, like that's something that I can aspire to. Um, how yeah. do we as teachers kind of walk that line between inspiring people, um, demystifying it so that it makes it something that I'm kind of clear that I can do? Um, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on balancing those sorts of, of, of factors or how those pieces sort of play in together. Yeah. I mean, I think over the years that I've run sketchbook school, I've hired probably a hundred or more instructors, you know, and when I go out and look for somebody who's going to teach a sketchbook school, they they have to be able to make art that, you like, you know, they have to be like a, they have to be good in that way. They have to be a good teacher, which is a very different thing. And mm -hmm. they have to be able to teach and sort of manage and present themselves live, you know, in this way. And there's a lot, a lot of people who are great illustrators, you know, and you look at their work and you go, that's so cool. And they're terrible teachers. They're just incapable of explaining what they're doing in such a way that's, so and, and I think that that happens a lot of times. People say to me, can you hire so-and-so? I love their work. And I'll go and, and I'll quickly find that like this person cannot break it down. And I, and I think I, I struggled with that initially too. How do you reverse engineer what you do so somebody mm -hmm. else can learn what it is? I find that in the end, there's some technical things that, that, instructors can teach you how to use a particular medium. Um, you know, how to, like, for instance, we just did a class on a workshop on watercolor pencils and this instructor showed how she used a, a an ordin, ordinary kitchen cheese grater or strainer, strainer to make these like little spatters. You go, oh, that's a really cool technique, you know? And she sort of talked us through it. And afterwards you said, oh, like I've seen that and I have no idea how you do that. And now I know how to do it. So those kinds of like, okay, now I get it things um, are a small part of what I think teaching art is, right? And I think that, I think there's a lot of people who go on YouTube and they, they look for instructional videos, like how do you draw a, a dog, you know, or what are the steps that I take, you know, to take, to get to this end result? 
you know, and they break it down. Here's like 15 steps for a straw circle, then divide it in half, all those kinds of steps. I don't think, again, that particularly helps you to make art either. You know, I think in the end, so much of it is about how do you give me confidence? So again, if you're really good and I can't even vaguely approximate what you do, it shatters my confidence. It doesn't build my confidence. Confidence is really important in art making because ultimately the core of art, I think, is authenticity, expressing who you are as an individual. And you need, and that takes, that takes some guts, right? And it takes, and it takes some, some time to kind of get into it and to allow yourself to be who you are. And if you're really intimidated or you're faced with failure over and over again and no rewards from it, then, then you just can't get to that point of authenticity. And so much of style isn't technique, it's authenticity. It's like, what are the things? And you might look at a lot of artists and say, I really like their work and I'm absorbing it. But ultimately, it comes back to who are you and what are you going to do? So I think creating an environment like that, and that goes back to the example I gave of, you know, that teacher who let me sit in the back of the classroom and just kind of read books and absorb my own way, absorb an entire language just by sitting and listening to it. And that's kind of true of when you teach kids how to walk or how to use the potty or how to read a book. It's right. It's, it's a customized kind of thing based on your knowledge of them and where, where their strengths are and how do you keep them engaged and interested and what motivates them. It's all personal. It's not about a system. You can read all kinds of books on how to teach a kid to walk, but ultimately it's feeling and it's like it's connection and it's noticing and empathy. And I think that's what good teachers are is there people who you know, can make you feel connected to them, can make you see it from their point of view, who you take for granted knows all this stuff, whether they do or not, but that's really less of it. And I think it's more about this environment. I don't know, but I'm speaking as somebody who never went to teacher's college and probably doesn't know what he's talking about much of the time. So anyway. Uh, but you've got comment. a track record of finding things that work. <laughs> So. I think that's in the end, that's, that's really what it is. Like, how do, how do you make something that works? How do you figure out what you need now to do this thing? And I think, again, going back to these first principles, what are the things that you need to do to, um, to have confidence and to have a framework? But then a lot of it, the rest of it is just practice and trial and error and stuff. So. Anyway, all right. I think we are, we have, we have, uh, I think we could go on talking about this. I'm feeling a little insecure, though, honestly, because I feel like I feel like I can imagine there's a lot of teachers listening to this and saying, "What the hell is? What the hell are they talking about?" But, but um, anyway, um, I, I I think you're selling yourself short. I know because that's, of that's the. Uh, <laughs> okay. <clears throat> um, well, uh, then I'll 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 see your humility there with um, some gratitude for what you have done in making a carefully curated collection of teachers and 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 sources of inspiration and putting those in front of people at a pace that they can absorb and learn with. Because um, I think you've got a track record of what you're doing, your approach to it actually works. No, I think that's true. And I, th I appreciate you pointing it out. Um, you know, I think, I think in the end, I've learned to teach because I've learned to teach myself. I think mm -hmm. that's been the core of it. I think most of the books I've written have started from a point of like, where's, where's the book I'd like to read? You know, and then I, I couldn't find it, so I wrote it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, and I think similarly with like, there were no classes on how to do sketchbook journaling. They didn't exist. So we kind of made them and you kind of figure it out as you go. Um, but it's, it's an interesting process. As is making this podcast and figuring this out too, so so good. Well, I think we'll wrap this up. Are you cool with doing that? I I am. Thank you so much for uh, for your your time today. Enjoyed bat batting these ideas around. Yeah, it was fun. It was fun. Um, whoops, wrong theme. <laughs> All right. Thanks for joining us, and we will see you again or hear you talk to you again next week. Bye bye. Bye bye.